most of it's probably mental. You don't like dark places that are wet and uh, you're claustrophobic. You have a bunch of phobias and stuff. It's not going to be the place for you. So if you get up and fly over Phoenix today, you'll see a big open pit. So there was two, two periods of uh, mining up there. Uh, it first started around 1900 and it shut down 1920. And then they went in in 1956 and they started a big open pit, which actually destroyed a lot of the underground workings and it was shut down for the last time in 1978. So this is all from the, from the very last time when they mined back in the 50s and the 60s and this is the big open pit. Um, but by far, you know, the most interesting thing about Phoenix is, uh, is what's underground. So that's mostly what we're going to show you. This is actually straight ahead there. This is where the whole town of Phoenix was. There's nothing left there at all whatsoever. It's under about 150 feet of rock when they mined in the fifties. This is the back wall and this is where all the stuff that's still left here. So when you go back over the back wall, um, they destroyed all the, everything in the pit it was all the uh, same thing. It was all tunnels. There's 37 miles of tunnels there and that was all destroyed, but there's still miles and miles and miles of tunnels left in the back wall, and that's where, that's where we're going to go into. So as you start flying over it, you can start to see all these big holes, um, the open stopes, the tunnels, and, and that's all remnants from the mining that shut down in the 1920s. Pretty incredible to see it flying over it with an airplane, and you can see where these big, big, huge holes are that are still visible today. Um, we've got the drone here, so we're going to get the drone down here and show you some a little closer uh, aerial stuff uh, you fly over it pretty quick with the plane so there you go so with the drone there you can kind of see uh, pretty good where the bigger holes are and there's I don't know dozens and dozens of them there's all kinds of places to get into it's pretty neat and this is actually the rawhide the rawhide mine this is what they call BH it's called big hole and uh, it's I don't know it's probably about 20 feet by 30 feet something like that it's the biggest opening there but there's a whole bunch of openings and all all different sizes big ones small ones medium ones, ones you can barely squeeze through. This is the snowshoe pit. Uh, that was that was all mined too and it's flooded now. So the Phoenix is actually a, a combination of about 12 different mines that were all amalgamated together into one mine called uh, Phoenix. But really there was, you know, the gold drop, the rawhide, the monarch, the snowshoe, whole bunch of mines. So we'll just jump in there and we'll show you what's under there. And quite a bit of work, you know, going through there. And we spent about uh, three years actually going through all these and have all these videos. And we're just kind of put this all together, all the best stuff that we can show you there in, a, in about you know, 30 minutes or so of all the very best stuff under Phoenix. Well, this here is uh, called a square set. And uh, you can see it's like a Lego set. All those timbers are notched. And so when they used to mine, they put all them pieces in there and they build it up like a Lego set. And then they would mine the top of it out. But uh, they quit doing that because it's a very expensive way to mine because you have to cut all these timbers and put them up. And now what they, what they use is they use uh, pillars. They just keep these big pillars and they hold the formation up. So, um, and that was uh, one of the things that the Granby company started a long time ago that really made it a lot cheaper to mine than when they first started. So this is an example of a pillar. You can see these huge pillars and this is a pretty big area. If you look in that little hole, that's a ladder way back in there. So, and all in through these huge stopes, but still a lot of loose rock if, around the around the edges. And look at some of this rock, and it's really kind of dangerous. You have to look at the rock and and see if you want to go underneath it. That's just barely hanging in there, big cracks. And the frost is what is actually peeling this uh, rock off of there. So, so some of these holes are really tiny to go into. You know, some of this is pretty old footage, Jay. So we didn't have helmets to begin with, but they've just gotten our way anyhow. And then we started, you know, learning more about. Uh, about the art of exploring mines and got more safety gear and uh, and got helmets and that kind of stuff. But uh, so it's just a lot of these holes, it, it climbed in every little hole it could possibly get into. Some of them went in a long ways and got lots of cool stuff and a lot of them just didn't uh, didn't go in at all. Um, so this was kind of exciting. We're digging then through something and I had a bit of a, a, a whole bunch of rock slid down there, but it didn't get buried in there. Um, it was just kind of a funny thing that happened. Pulled myself through and then dug out. So uh yeah, lots of little holes we squeezed in and out of and uh, and dug down through it and uh, learned a lot of things as, as it was going along there. There's some stuff I did um, back then that I, I wouldn't do today. So so this is inside, the, you know, some of these big stopes and, and you see big holes here. Look at the size of some of these rocks that have fallen off the back uh, over the years. So, um, you know, that's definitely a hazard. I never had any big rocks fall off the top when I was in a mine, but um, yeah, it's a hazard. 
if something that big falls, uh, uh, you don't have to worry about getting injured anyhow. It'll just squash you like a bug. But uh, uh, same thing, you know, the frost gets in there and it peels those off. And then over time, it uh, they just kind of come down. So that's one of the hazards and mines in these big stopes. Uh, so uh, you'll notice a blue writing on some of these places. And, and we had to mark all these areas off because we kept getting lost and going back to the same places. Ended up using a whole case of paint. So this is a good example about something that was kind of maybe... I don't know, um, that I did was maybe a little careless and I didn't realize at the time. So I'm working my way up in this chute here, this ore chute where all the ore come down here and it's all kind of rotten and and it's okay. But um, look at that big rock there. So there's a, so we're pulling the, pulling this, uh, the rotten parts of the chute off and, you know, as, so you can tell it's all kind of rotted and falling apart. But um, this big rock here, so, <laughs> so I never really thought about this, but see this big rock probably weighs about 500 pounds. It barely sit in there. And as I was climbing up there, if that would have come loose, it probably would have fallen down and fallen on top of me. So um, by far the biggest hazard in mines is always something falling on you. And you really got to think about that. Um, you know, you think with ropes and stuff that, you know, you're worried about the rope breaking and you falling. Very unlikely for that to happen. But there's so much loose rock in there that really is a hazard. So we started to learn a lot more about ropes and stuff and getting that. And um, just went down some of these big shafts. This shaft was about 120 feet down. And um, some of them shafts, they didn't go anywhere. They just plugged at the bottom like this one was. And other ones went to different levels. So um, just kind of a lot of fun learning about the ropes and getting comfortable with it. Very exciting to go straight down some of these, uh, you know, these deep holes. And uh, and a lot of work to come back up. Uh, a lot of places we just had to use a, a rope and a hand line just to kind of guide you to go up and down. Um, very important with the ladders. Uh, some of them are very poor shape because they're 120 years old to... To have ropes, so if something happened, uh, then you know you'd be a, you wouldn't fall down. Uh, that's what killed a lot of miners in the old days. Uh, you know, either someone was working above them and some rock came down, or they slipped and fell down. Some of these big chutes, or you know, got run over by the trains, or a lot of different things. Um, don't really feel us that hazardous if you're very careful. You don't touch anything to kind of sneak through there. Um, but it's always the big hazard. Something's gonna something falls on you. Uh, you know, it's something that could uh, definitely do you a lot of damage. So, so the way uh, Phoenix is set up in a lot of other mines is a huge copper deposit, and then there's just big main railways underneath. So they have just big chutes that come down, and then they just funnel all the ore, and then it goes onto a train and went outside, and then it was loaded onto trains and into the smelter in, in Grand Forks. So uh, some of these uh, chutes are just huge, they big massive things. But you know, um, they took 4,500 tons of ore a day out of there, so it was a huge amount. This was a big uh, kind of a vein that was up there that was really loose up top. So they, they just uh, boarded the whole thing off and made like a false floor. And then they had all the chutes, uh, just had little holes in between. And then the, the carts, uh, they loaded up the ore and the carts. And uh, But it went that, that, uh, that deposit went way up quite far. And then it was all mined out. Eh? So it was just a really old part of that mine. It was probably around the turn of the century, around 1900. It's one of the lowest parts, and actually you can walk right out into the pit. So you can see there's a whole bunch of squares set in there. They made a big kind of a, um, I don't know, a chute that went all the way down. So they would have mined it, the ore going down there to begin with, and then they just keep mining it off, and this is the main level. So there's so many branches, and like you say, we just had to use paint and stuff to uh, just to mark our way around because you just kept, end up going to the same places and, you're confused. You don't know where you've been and where stuff goes out. It's very difficult. It's a huge, uh, you know, I spent like weeks and weeks going through the, that's uh, you know, there's miles and miles of tunnels there. It's just huge and very difficult to find your way around uh, just but from memory. One of the really cool things about Phoenix is the ice in there. There's a lot of places that are permanently frozen um, year round. It melts a little bit in the summertime, but then the ice forms back in the wintertime. Some of the areas are starting to retreat because we opened up some areas that were closed and the air is moving through there. So that's one of the really unique things. So this one part, uh, it was frozen, but there was also open water. So we had to uh, go in with a waterproof suit to try to get to this end of the thing. And um, it was pretty exciting. So this kind of a waterproof suit. And this is just clear ice. I was walking through it. And as I got into the other part, it uh, wasn't frozen as far. So I fell through the ice. Um, so I don't know, it was pretty exciting, I guess it wasn't a total surprise. So it was kind of prepared for it. And, uh, yeah, that waterproof suit wasn't waterproof, but, uh, I managed to crawl my way out of the ice and it was all right. It was all good. So the reason you have flooded uh, parts in Phoenix is basically the, 
Um, you see those big shoots, they, uh, a lot of them are pretty rotten, so there's either a bunch of rock come down or they just completely fail. So it makes a dam so the water you know, can't get out. Usually most of these, uh, these rail lines are built at a slight increase, so they drain themselves. But over the years, you know, rocks get up there, and, that, and that's why you have deep areas that have water in them. So some places it's water, and some places it's ice. There's a bench there, and that's where the chute guy would have stood and operated the chute that opened and closed. As you can see, there's about two or three feet of ice here uh, because the chute would have been that much higher for the train to get underneath. There's still quite a bit of ice there, but it makes it easy walking when you're just walking on top of the ice. So there's lots of other common interesting formations in here, and uh, here we're coming up to a raise. So you look up there, and that's a chased a, a mineral vein up there, and you'll just see there's just a, a little band that just kind of pinched out. You can see where the pay is, just that thin band is with the, where the ore was. And it pinched out and they didn't go any further up that raise. Some of the craftsmanship is just fantastic, uh, especially in this. So you see this one here, you can see all those timbers and how they were notched in there and how tight all this fit in there. It looked like there's some kind of a master log builder or something. But that was a trade they had. The timbermen, they specialized in that. You know, the miners did their job and there's timbermen and trackmen. They had lights inside of Phoenix. So these are, these are the electric lines and this is just where the lights were because they had all lights there. This was actually for the train, the electric uh, electric train that's the very end. And this brings us to one of the most interesting places in, in Phoenix, or one of the most interesting artifacts. And here's an old train that was under here. So there's 10 of these old carts. Now, these carts are very old carts. And here we built a brand new one. We took all the parts of one of them old carts, and we totally took them apart, and we reconstructed it. So this is what it looks like when it was brand new. So we just took all the metal parts of one of these some of these carts, and we built a brand new one. We stuck this in our museum. So uh, we wanted to preserve that so people could see what these carts looked like. These carts were uh, first, uh, when they first started the mine, they were pulled by mules or by horses, and then after by train. Um, but these are these are old wooden carts, and they were replaced with, uh, with metal cars uh, called the Granby cars in later years. And this is the reason why these were here, because they're just uh, wooden carts. They're pretty crude. And they just pushed them into a place in the mine. And there's many places they just pushed them over the bank. So these are obsolete, old, very old carts. Um, down the, and the interesting thing is, you look at them, and no two are exactly the same. They are kind of unique. Eh? Um, some of them had uh, different features on them. And, and here's the you know the tailgate and the locks and, and everything like that. And um, also, they're not solid either. They just kind of had chains that, uh, that held them together. So originally, they would have just... A mule or a horse would have pulled just one cart, and then uh, they strung them together. So here is some graffiti. You see that in the mine all the time, and it's really cool. It's made by a, a carbide lamp, and you can just write against the walls. And uh, it's kind of tradition of the miners, and lots of times when they finish uh, a drift or something at the end, they would write their names on it. But then also explorers in later years, in 1940, the, the mine been closed for a long time. There were just people that were either doing some surveying or exploring, and uh, and they just kind of wrote their name on the on the end of it. Cart here. And basically this is just like a wheelbarrow in a mine. It's very small. And uh, it's just for a small area here. They've just shoveled ore into there, pushed it along there, and then dumped it into the into the ore chute. And see this is all riveted. Arc welding wasn't common until about 1920, so anything before uh, that was constructed before that's all riveted. Here's another one of those little carts. Uh, they're not very big. They just would have pulled those by hand. So you can see the, the axles and stuff off are there, but the tipping mechanisms are still there. So we actually ended up taking this one completely apart, and um, and we rebuilt it uh, in our museum. So we took this, uh, it's called the truck or whatever. Uh, this is where the axles are. And this is pretty old. It doesn't have wheel bearings. They just use uh, the squirt oil in there, and it just turned on there. There's no bearings, and there's nothing welded on here. So this is pretty old. It would have been built around the turn of the century or so. And basically, it's just a wheelbarrow and a mine, and the, and the miners load those up and took that. There's also all kinds of old boxes and some really cool stuff. Uh, a bunch of it was frozen in. This one here had a uh, tracks uh, track gauge inside of it, and uh, tools, and you see all kinds of uh, railway spikes and uh, hammers and different things, and uh, found all kinds of cool stuff in these boxes as they come out. This is the bottom part of uh, of the big ore carts, uh, like the one I have my museum there. So um, that that's sitting there on the top, that's the top part of that same same cart, same ones uh, I, that I rebuilt in the museum there. So there's uh, yeah, there's quite a few, like a lot of interesting old artifacts, and especially with 
some of the areas that are starting to thaw out in the ice, we're seeing stuff uh, coming out of the ice on a, on a pretty regular basis. So it's kind of neat going back every year and seeing what changes. This is the miners would have had their boots and stuff in there. Just a little storage thing. And this is a really old staircase It's and uh, some old drums. It's a, it's a really neat feature that you see that. It looks like an old haunted house or something like that. Um, but the you know, stairs are pretty rotten and stuff, but pretty neat to see that. And there's a, another shot from the top of the stairs there. And uh, we tried to dig it out in the bottom, but we have no idea actually where it went to. It's all collapsed in there. And this is an old drum and it's gone now. It's uh, Somebody took it out of there, but I had a little small one like that. I took and put my museum and it just rotted. As soon as it got out in the daylight, it just rotted in no time at all. So there's a really old ore chute gate that's all riveted. Lots of those old riveted uh, ore chute gates there. And here's another style of uh, of cart that's underneath an ore chute there. That's uh, just got abandoned there. And then with lots of dynamite and uh, and um, explosives, uh, explosive boxes from uh, CIL, uh, Polar, uh, Hamilton Powder Company, Giant Powder Company. And uh, this was a really nice box that uh, a guy was in there. He found it and it was uh, the rats just buried. I don't know why they didn't chew it, but um, it looked like it was almost just set there. So the Giant Powder Company was first... Uh, Alfred Nobel was the one that first allowed them the patent to produce dynamite. He invented dynamite. So that's a really old, rare box and just in, in pristine condition. Most everything's rotted. Uh, here's some dynamite and lots of dynamite. You see it here and there, case here and there, and uh, loose sticks of dynamite. Um, here's some more. Um, this, we will want this box, eh? And uh, it it's really dangerous if it uh, starts to sweat. Uh, but this stuff didn't seem to be sweating. Uh Probably is a little careless with that. I don't know if I'd do that again today. But um, yeah, luckily it didn't blow up or anything. So we did a kind of experiment. Um, so we took a bunch of this dynamite and uh, someone told us that um, after 50 years or so, the nitroglycerin sweats out of it. It's not dangerous anymore. Um, so we wanted to test that theory because when we dumped that out, we could smell stuff. So we actually took a fuse, a blasting cap, and uh, we put it on under about six sticks of dynamite or something. And... Uh, we lit the fuse and you know, we had three minutes to run out and had an old camera that we zoomed in and, and we took a picture of it uh, and luckily it didn't blow the camera up. But um, yeah, that dynamite was still good. And you can see that there's a slow motion. There's a big rock that rolls across the screen. Um, you know, so there was a fair bit of powder left in there. So that's a bird's nest. Here's some old tools. Uh, this is a shovel. Um, and you're always digging up stuff and see lots of, lots of tools and stuff were abandoned. In some of the mines, it was just all, uh, and here's a scaling bar. So the scaling bar, they use that to, to bring down any loose rocks after they blast and stuff. And this brings us to a big frozen section. There's some place you can't even get into. They're completely frozen off. This is what we call the ice palace. It's a huge formation. It's like a big skating rink. And there's a huge slab of ice there that is 15 feet thick. We measured it. And uh, over time, because we opened this area up, the air started circling through there and it started melting. And then we noticed all of a sudden there was a bit of a, a gap from the wall on the side of the ribs. And we looked down there and thought, oh, that's wide enough. You know, we could probably get down there. So we were able to actually go along this little ledge, a thin ledge along there. And, and it kind of uh, went down into a, into another really cool section. But it's really neat to be underneath that ice and you look up and there's just a huge slab of ice, 15 feet thick. Uh, it's like you're under a big glacier and uh, really surprising and it just melts a little bit. It's melting very slowly. In three years, uh, there's only about 12 feet of ice now where there was 15 feet of ice. And actually the ice has melted about six feet away from the side now where it was just in this picture, just barely wide enough to walk uh, by. So it's kind of cool. And again, you know, more and more stuff is coming out of the ice every year. So we're discovering more stuff that we hadn't seen under the ice before and the, there's a there was a whole new section underneath that part of the mine that we never ever saw before um, that nobody obviously have, has been able to get into for a very long time because it was completely uh, sealed off by ice but um, so we we're able to get down there and there was a ladder there um, the ladder is in still pretty good shape but we had to get ropes to get down to it and there was another level underneath there and we we're able to explore that and uh, we can show you some of that in a little while so but it was one of the most uh, amazing things to be able to, to get down underneath that ice and explore along the, the sides of the ice palace, the bottom of the ice palace. And um, anytime you bring someone in there, they're always amazed by, 
but the ice, you know, um, when you go in there, it's a very beautiful place to go along there and take pictures and stuff. And it's, it's always fun showing people that they've never seen anything like that before. So this is the bottom part. Um, this is actually a, a big ore chute where they tipped ore down and the metal on that frame is to keep that from wearing away and, and uh, the ore went down to a lower level. Oh, there's wet sections in Phoenix too. Uh, you know, for a mine that size, it's not really too bad. Uh, mostly fairly dry. It's actually surprising from year to year. Some years you'll have a place that's got maybe a couple of feet of water and then the next year you go back and it's dry. So uh, it kind of depends on the you know, how things are freezing and thawing out in any particular time. But most places you can get through with, uh, you know, uh, rubber boots. The odd place a little higher than that. And uh, this brings us out to the... This is the one of the main entrances going into Phoenix. This is the, the gold drop, uh, the number three portal. It was the main hall level. And a lot of ore came in and out of there. For a, There was a blacksmith shop right on the outside of that. So the, um, also we've seen a, a buck in there. So that happens in mines sometimes. A deer will get in there. And uh, rats are very common. You see rats in mines. And uh, yeah, they're not really scared of people. They're kind of cute, you know. But uh, I don't really enjoy them all that much. For one thing, they're really stinky with... Uh, what I'd prefer to see is some cute looking girls in mines. <laughs> ah, it's always fun to take someone into a mine that's never been to a mine and uh, show them around. So, uh, well, lots of interesting places to see. And there's some bucket there. And this area is another area that's kind of below the ice palace. It's uh, It's got some huge icicles and stuff in there. So I went in there and uh, filmed some of this stuff. And same thing, you know, it's, uh, it was a, just a tiny little hole that he squeezed down into. And uh, dug it open. It's basically just kind of sealed uh, year round. But there's a another level down there, and there's a track, and a whole bunch of ice and artifacts and big ore shoots in there. And there's ice flowing down from some higher levels from there. So this is actually very unique. Uh, there's very few mines. I've never been in a mine that there's ice year round in other than this one. And it's actually not in a huge part of the mine, but you do see it. So if you look up, you can see the hangar for the electric railways, which is amazing. You know, they hauled 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And, uh, you know, they had electric railway underneath the that mine on top of a mountain, you know, 120 years ago. You know, just actually fantastic when you think of that, you know, the technology. And they hauled ore um, out of that mine up at Phoenix to Grand Forks, to the smelter, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, right until 1920 when it was shut down. And there's been nothing that's happened since then, so... You know, everything here is, uh, you know, at least 100 years old that you see inside this mine. So pretty interesting to, you know, to take people that have never been underground and stuff before and uh, and show them some of this history. It's, it's one thing to read about it. It's uh, something else to see it. So we're just going to take the girls here for a little tour of the cars. And, and then uh, I'm going to climb around some of these big stopes. And it's really fantastic to see how large some of these uh, the stopes are in these mined areas that you can walk up there. So luckily they're in pretty good shape. They're able to make her up and down there. And you just look at some of these huge holes into there. And this is a big glory hole. They call that a glory hole. It's just a huge pit. And they mined everything out underneath there all the way to the surface. And it went into the trains below and uh, and it took off from there. So um, yeah, this is another shot of BH, which is that big hole um, that come right to the surface. They call that a surface stope. So Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this uh, tour of, uh, of the Phoenix Mines uh, and the Granby that operated it. And uh, it was one of the most fascinating mines that I've ever seen. And we've been there so many times, so we just thought we'd kind of put everything together into, into one, uh, you know, 25-minute video for you.